cheer and festivities. Christmas fun flying through the trees, sleigh bells jingling. Sack all full of toys, bringing Christmas joy to every boy and girl all over the world. Spread seasons, greetings, and slide down the chimneys and give all the gifts, cause I'm Santa Claus. Sit on my lap and tell me. Welcome back to another hour of Scotch Hour. I am Noah. And I'm Jesse. All right. This is episode, if I'm correct, 94? 94. Okay. Episode 94. Uh, this evening, um, I'm just going to skip over the Scotch because I don't know what it's going to be yet. <laughs> uh, this is the uh, Christmas uh, week here. So Merry Christmas to all of our listeners and viewers out there. Um, we will go into our shout outs and uh, get it together. It's followed up by our restaurant review of the... The Parker Garage. The Parker Garage. And then from there, we will uh, do our Smarter Challenge, being uh, the movie review of Violent Night. Maker of the list, gonna check it twice, gonna find out if you're naughty or nice. All right, this evening, we've got the coin toss. Two options here. We're either gonna have Santa's big lump of coal this big ass lump of coal apparently with the glenn glasgow revival not that it's not a good scotch but compared to rudolph's much deserved nightcap we've got the mccallan the harmony collection rich cocoa so this was last year's edition it's supposed to be pretty magnificent although i don't think we've ever had a the mccallan that was not all right you want to call it uh, no, I'll let you call it. It's all you. <laughs> all right. We're You'll going. decide whether or not we get uh, a lump of coal or a Christmas present. All right. So Have we been naughty or nice? That's right. Naughty or nice. So the McAllen will be heads. Hopefully Santa Claus is pretty lenient because <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what his definition of nice is. And uh, <laughs> the Glasgow revival will be tails. Come on, heads. Heads it is! Oh, <laughs> nice. Two in a row, we get the right scotch. So we have been nice. Santa's big ass lump of coal in the gun Glasgow will be saved for a future naughty <laughs> endeavor. And it has to be conservative. <laughs> Right. And Rudolph's <laughs> much deserved nightcap and this the McAllen, the Harmony Collection Rich Cocoa is tonight's scotch. Um, with that, we've got previous experience with the McAllen and it literally has never let us down. I mean, I can't think of one time the McAllen wasn't fantastic. They do a nice job as always with the box, with the packaging, uh, especially as a gift or if you're going to somewhere special, um, that's kind of a big deal, especially to myself um, and to many others. With that, without further ado, the box again. This box is magnificent. The bottle, even more so. Oh, wow. You, you really do have to like the McCallum. <laughs> and, and the way they do their bottling and their labeling there. And the holograms to ensure. I, uh, cause I remember, I'm not sure if anyone really remembers from uh, one of our episodes way back when, when we did like a whole line of McCallum's. Uh, but there was a point when they when they were when the newest owners kind of brought brought them back to life. Basically, yes, um, they discovered some of the uh, older barrels were actually were kind of like fraudulent barrels, so they had to start ensuring the uh, that the scotches were on point. And so then they started doing these hologram um, type stickers on them, right? 
if I remember correctly, something yes. like something along those lines. That is one of the things they did after getting busted for selling 60 year old bottles of scotch that weren't 60 year old bottles of scotch. <laughs> All right. Well, with this, the McAllen Highland single malt scotch whiskey, um, they started making scotch and you can always visit their website or our previous episodes all the way back in 1824. They, much like any other distillery, have had their ups and downs. Typically, war has brought them hardship and then prosperous times have done them well. They have done really well the past 20 20 years. Um, some of the more recent releases um, include the newer version of the Harmony Collection, um, as well as the Bond Collection. Would love to get my hands on one of those 60-year-old bottles or 60-year-aged scotches um, that were celebrated in the Bond movies. All right, so this particular scotch was done in collaboration with Jordi Roca. Um, he is the pastry chef at El Sela de Con Roca. Um, I, I, I'm so eager to open this bottle. I don't even know if I want to keep talking or just pop it open. <laughs> Anything else you want to say about the McCallum before we get started? Uh, no, not off the top of my head. All right, I am excited for this, so we will uh, try to not oh. destroy this as we open it. I wasn't fully prepared either way, so. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we got real cork, but much like everyone else, they are going to a plastic topper. Um, the hologram is there. And man, they definitely take this one pretty serious because it does actually have a screw on top. It doesn't just pop in on top. On top of that, it screws on. Great color through and through. Uh, it does have that nice color that we like. Play with that later. <laughs> <All right. laughs> the McAllen doesn't disappoint. It hasn't disappointed us in all the other versions that we've tried. Starting off way back when, I think like maybe episode two or three, when we started off with the triple cask. And then from there, we went to the double cask. Uh, the double cask, uh, and then we did the twelve year sherry, and um, uh, we did the uh, the edition number six. Um, and uh, I honestly can't recall a time where we did not like the McAllen. <laughs> and, and this is really no different here. This one is actually like the like it's quite a bit different than how edition number six was, and, and I really love the edition number six. The color here. The dark brassy color, like we kind of got um, from the edition number six, kind of reminds me of that. I put um, actually, um, yeah, I put dark brass, and I, I really do like the coloring here. Um, and when it comes to the flavors, now when I first started to smell the bouquet or the aroma of this particular scotch, it really did kind of remind me of like a one of those really nice quality dark chocolates that you would get at the store that probably somewhere between like 70 to 85 percent uh dark chocolate or cocoa uh and um so you're not really getting like that super sweetness but on the aroma i'm getting some malt um that was like actually the first thing i hit i got the hint of was the malt followed up with the cocoa um and a bit of graham cracker with um the sweetness of a pear and i i mean i i don't know how like how all these things would actually taste if you had them all combined together <laughs> uh as far as like if you had it like in a meal right if i had if i were to go take like a a, a chunk of like dark chocolate um 
with uh, like a bit of like malt powder with uh, like a pear and a graham cracker and try to make a, uh, some kind of Frankenstein uh, schmore, s'mores there. I'm not exactly sure how it really would taste, but this is how I'd imagine it would taste. Because when I start to sip on this scotch, right, I'm getting like hints of fig along with chocolate and with a spiciness of ginger. And it really, that that sweetness of the of the uh, of the uh, fig, along with the uh, uh, the bitterness of the nice dark chocolate, along with the spiciness of the ginger, really makes for a uh, a nice, complex, sweet, and um, wonderful uh, sensation on the palate. And it's and it does and it has a slight bit of velvet velvetiness to it to where it does coat your mouth very well. It's uh, I would say it's medium bodied, and the finish right. And I talked about the ginger, given that that slight spiciness, and that slight spiciness from the ginger I think kind of carries you into the finish there, and it just has a lingering dark chocolate finish, and I love that because I love dark. Personally, I love dark chocolate. Like I had this uh, like in. in when I used to live in Boulder, I had this doctor, and some of my friends would make fun of me because they always called him like the righteous chi doctor. And he'd always, he would actually prescribe uh, dark chocolate uh, to me and stuff like that. You know, go to like Whole Foods and get yourself a block, a block of dark chocolate because dark chocolate is supposed to be somewhat healthy for you. And, and, and this kind of reminds me of some of those nice like imported dark chocolates that we would get here. And uh, I, I highly recommend this. I would not take this to a poker game. Not at all. <laughs> um, depending on like what kind of um, affair, like a like a high end affair, I probably would take it to. Like maybe if it's a black tie affair, I would I would I would do that. So if I was gonna have to go to you know a place you know some kind of party like um, um, that where you you would you know black tie affair, then yeah, I probably would, I could see having this or taking this along with me. But this would be something I would kind of store in my cellar or kind of keep on my shelf there and and would only share with either myself or a good friend who or someone who would uh, actually respect a well-developed uh, scotch. Because I think this is a well-developed scotch. A little bit on the sweeter side. I think you can even enjoy it after a really nice meal. Um, yeah, so I definitely give this two thumbs up. I don't think you can get this version anymore uh, in the stores. Uh, and if you can, I would highly recommend picking it up. Absolutely. Oh my goodness. Okay. So first of all, 44% ABV and it does not slap at all. So it is a very well-rounded smooth scotch for 44% ABV. Uh, one of the backstories behind this particular scotch is that Polly Logan, one of the master blenders for the Macallan, went to Spain when getting ready to blend this scotch and fully immersed herself in the world of chocolate and all the different aspects of it. So the rich chocolates, the milk chocolates, um, and really, uh, again, with the partnership um, with Jordi Roca, um, took time to get to understand this pastry chef's craft with this delicacy. And I am going to say it just like that. It truly is to me a delicacy. It is beautiful on uh, the eye. The color is, they like to say, toasted cocoa and i actually think they've nailed it this is definitely that same deep brass as the mccallan edition number six uh wonderful on the nose it um has it brings me back so many pleasant memories it reminds me of that first time i had a great chocolate fondue and somebody put some great Grand Meunier in there. Um, so the, the liquor came out, but the chocolate, of course, was always there. Um, but but that, that taste of a liqueur inside absolutely brought the fondue to life. Um, it also reminds me of the first time I had a chocolate Grand Meunier souffle uh, when my parents took me to uh, Victoria, British Columbia. We went to a little restaurant there, um, Perry, and uh, that was my dessert. And again, the same thing. It's got this wonderful cocoa. It's almost 
a, it's almost improper to call it chocolate because it's not really chocolate. It is truly cocoa. It's rich and it's deep and it's not that flour-based, sugar-based flavor. It is all cocoa. So on the nose, I get that chocolate fondue and a, a little bit of what they would call chocolate fondant. And um, what that is, again, is it's the cocoa. It's more of the cocoa than anything else. It's, it's not bitter, but it is definitely not super sweet. The dates, vanilla, and just a hint of a, a honey cinnamon. Again, this is not a sugary cinnamon, but it's not just cinnamon. It is sweet. On the palate, it is decadent, um, literally reminiscent for me of uh, a year and a month ago when we did enjoy the McAllen, the edition number six. And it is unlike anything else. Dark chocolate. That's where the dark chocolate absolutely comes in. Honey. Immediately followed with honey. Um, hints of dates. Vanilla. Cinnamon again. And then just a touch of ginger. You mentioned ginger. I think that is part of what leads into a very wonderful long finish of rich chocolate and a hint of oak and those two together for me with this um it's still all like the finish is so long it's still going right now and it's all of those flavors i'm still getting the dark chocolate and the the hint of honey with cinnamon and ginger and there's one other thing i think that i get at the front of the palette um that revisits right at the end and that is a hint of lime um, I, and I love it I dig it it is a fantastic scotch um, a super long finish would I take it to a poker game probably not this is not a scotch you don't want to focus on it. and if you're focused on the scotch you're not focused on your cards um, I agree with you though a high-end black tie event great friends definitely great family this is a wonderful treat if you can get yourself a bottle of this do indulge enjoy especially if you like that cocoa flavor in your scotch It's time for our shout outs. Um, I do have a, a couple of shout outs, actually really just one shout out. Um, this is to all of those of you out there who are, and I'm going to use the term brave enough, no matter what time, but especially this time of year to look for opportunities outside of your current comfort zone or discomfort zone maybe, um, and switch jobs and do it right. I really respect those of you who put in that two week notice and actually give 100% those last two weeks, trying to set up your establishment, your business, um, your store, whatever line of work you're in, and actually try to leave them set up for success. Uh, but really, the, the big piece is good for you for taking a risk to try to better your life for yourself and your family. My, uh, my shout out goes to you. Um, and really, this kind of came from this. I was watching this video on YouTube. Uh, it's just a uh, content creator. He kind of makes like these like gangster raps, like to, like uh, <laughs> Christmas tunes and stuff like this. <laughs> and he, he actually had this one. Uh, oh no! <laughs> he had this one where he actually wasn't actually doing a tune, but he was like just talking to other content creators, saying that. You know, part of being a content creator is being creative and trying new things. And I, I remember, like, earlier this week, uh, we had a conversation, and I was kind of saying, like, um, it seemed a little bit weird that you're doing, like, these these uh, flip uh, the coin choices, toss. coin tosses <laughs> for our scotches. But, like, listening to his, like, his little, like, two-minute thing about, like, you know, experimenting with content creating and stuff like that and how it's good to kind of like get your get yourself out of your comfort zone a little bit and kind of try new things to see how things kind of like take and see what people may or may not like. 
uh, just kind of reminded me of what you're doing here with like just you know challenging doing something different and it and i and so that kind of just made me appreciate this a little bit more and i, I just want to say thank you on the air about that i didn't like i don't think you knew i was going to say anything about this at all I did not and on, honestly i think as we go looking forward into the new year uh, I think we should start exploring some of our ideas and so, uh, that we've uh, talked about with using the green screen that we've had that we we've had <laughs> for a year. Yeah, that we've had for a year that we haven't really used. Uh, <laughs> maybe start looking at the uh, remote mics that we have um, and start using and playing around, doing a little bit more stuff with our content, uh, and, and and not so much be tied into this format all the time. Um, I think it might be kind of fun to do, maybe. I 100% love that. Um, I think that's a great idea, Noah. Um, and one of the things about the coin toss for me was to keep us on our toes. When I was <laughs> thinking about it, it was really like, okay, if we always know what scotch we're going to drink and it's, we either know it's low or it's high, where is that excitement, even for just us as the the hosts of the show? Where is that excitement? And um, we have really lucked out the last two times the coin toss has <laughs> landed on the high and not the low. Um, first, you know, a few weeks ago, we had the King Alexander the Third, and now the McAllen, the Harmony, Coco. And it has been... Um, it's fantastic. And you guys probably don't know this. Um, I, Noah might see the sweat as I'm getting ready to flip that quarter, <laughs> that coin, the dollar. Cause I'm like, Oh, please, 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 please. <laughs> Let's be the good one. Let's be the good one. <laughs> Let's not be naughty because this, this is the treat I wanted tonight. And, and thankfully it worked out. It's worked out both times. It could have gone the other way. <laughs> it could have. So I, I'm very grateful that it hasn't. Um, but uh, so I want to give a, a shout out to you, and I guess in the in a sense I'm giving a shout out to this uh, content creator. Name is uh, Rise Hendrick, and uh, he if you want to listen to some funny stuff, like he does like a Jingle Bells uh, type of music in the background, and he does a gangster rap to it, talking about like loading his Glock and shooting people. It's kind of funny. It's a little bit twisted, but it's uh, but anyways, uh, he has some good good content, but what he his message was to the content creators out there of the world uh i just you know maybe uh realize what you're doing here and just makes me appreciate you that much more so thank you very much shout out Cheers. to you um get it together uh it's a holiday season it's christmas <laughs> season i'm gonna i'm gonna lay off the uh, get it together <laughs> this week all right well uh, i am not <laughs> <laughs> okay so i've got Take it away. one get it together and then one other piece just about the economics and the the first thing the, the get it together is out there for um, those who lead and are hypocritical with their own actions so they are the people who are do as i say and not as i do and i understand um, there are times and places where that's real. And some of those times and places might be generals leading us into a world war uh, or a Vietnam war or a revolution. Um, that might be when some of those things are appropriate. But um, for me in particular, when I work with a leader that um, challenges others but doesn't live by those same standards, I lose a lot of respect and trust very quickly. Um, so for any any people who are doing that, Get it together, take a minute, take a step back um, and consider, as I do as well, um, am I leading the right way? Because one of the things I wanted to do this quarter um, for myself and really for my team was to be a good boss and looking at the different ways I'm impacted by my boss, but then also am I doing those same things to my team? And and thankfully I can say, no, I, I don't. I actually um, am someone that I ask my team and they tell me, yeah, Jesse, I trust you. I may not always get the answer I want, when I ask you, but I trust you that you've got my back and that you're going to give me the honest answer. And that is absolutely how I try to lead. And um, for the other piece, just the educational piece, this is again on the economics and just thinking about the way the world turns and our current state of affairs. One thing to really consider, consider uh, the automobile shortage, so to speak, that has happened and how few of particularly some makes and models of cars have been coming off production lines. Um, I'm going to use one car brand that I highly, super highly respect. And you guys have heard me all year long with Formula One talk about Honda and their great engines. But if you follow the past 
year and the changes they've made on their production and assembly lines, they have continued to reduce production. Um, and what are reasons for this? Well, one reason could be on a negative side for them, there's a chip shortage. Well, let's say that that's actually eliminated and they themselves don't have a chip shortage. What's the other reason? The positive side for them is by continuing to limit production, you are less quick to flood the market or increase the market shares available, therefore decreasing the value of the vehicles. So whether it's a Mazda or it's a Honda or it's a Chevy or it's a Ford, or it's a Ferrari, at the end of the day, uh, fewer models, fewer vehicles, fewer units uh, means most likely a higher demand. And that is one way to artificially keep prices high. Um, so just consider that when you're thinking about um, different costs. And, uh, you know, if you, if you think, well, what's a similar relatable experience, just think about the housing market. Um, all of a sudden now the housing market is flooded with houses and the prices are dropping uh, here in the Denver metro area. I've heard they've dropped on average 10 to 14 percent. So the average that would be 12 percent um, over the course of the second half of this year for a five hundred thousand dollar house. That's sixty thousand dollars. That is a huge chunk of change. Um, and the same might happen to cars. All of a sudden, car prices were going down 12%. How many car buyers would be that much happier? How many car sellers would be that much happier? No. Um, so just consider when you're talking about your own future needs, uh, do a little planning, doing a little thought, look at the economics, look at the state of affairs, and um, try to plan accordingly. All right, the Parker Garage located here in Parker, Colorado, just off of Main Street. Well, this evening, as we went to the Parker Garage, from the outside, it's not a bad looking place. From the inside, pretty decent looking place. Then you get the menus, look like they've been run over by a train. <laughs> Um, then you look at the menus and you see the 40 and $50 dinners. And that's a little bit of a surprise because usually when you go to a 40 or $50 steak steakhouse, the, the menu isn't just a piece of paper. It's a little bit different. Um, great wine list. Same thing though on the back of that menu uh, was the list of wines. And you know, for $230, you can get a great bottle. Um, but a little bit of the panache was lost um, in the service. Yeah, I, I would agree. Uh, the, you know, when you see it from the outside, first of all, there's hardly any parking around there uh, because it is in downtown Parker. Uh, but you can park across the way in the uh, in the park there or uh, behind. Um, but in any case, when you walk in there, you know the outside does look pretty inviting. I, I think it'd be really like a really nice place during the summertime. Um, it, it really, we are in December, like you know, right before Christmas. When you walk in, the uh, the atmosphere, the interior. It, um, I'm not really sure how the atmosphere is because we got there kind of early, so it could you be it might be hot in there later later in the evening or whatever. Um, but since we we're there a little bit earlier, uh, they have a happy hour, but I wouldn't, I couldn't really tell if there was a happy hour. <laughs> uh, the inside, right? The inside was kind of nice. I mean, I do like the kind of like the, I don't think it's actually real wooden floor. So I think it's a fake, a fake wooden floor, but it looks kind of nice. The bar area is really nice. I like how you pointed out they did have uh, foot rest for when you are sitting up at the bar, which is kind of nice because I hate when you go to a, when you have like those like those high chairs and you're at a bar and there's like nowhere to put your feet, <laughs> and uh, so it was kind of nice that they had a foot rest there. And um, some of the things I noticed, like when we walked in there, as you talked about, when you go to a, a, like a nice sit down restaurant, if, or at least a place that's going to be charging you like you know at least like you know I guess like upper middle class type of a uh, uh, menu. Um, you expect to have like a decent menu, like a, you expect to have a menu given to you, whether it's even like, like the hard board where they slide the pieces of paper in there and have like the little corner sections on it or something, but you don't expect a, a flimsy piece of paper that's crinkly and has stains or creases and stuff like that. Uh, cause right there at that point, you're like, okay, I see the prices on here. Uh, $50 for a steak, you know, $40 for a pasta. And 
you're looking at this menu like, okay, so you guys are cutting corners on your menu, but you're charging premium prices here or not like five star prices, but you know, definitely like more than your average Joe type of like restaurant. Um, and you just give me a lousy piece of paper, the menu on it at that point, at least for me, I kind of lose trust in that in that restaurant. Like, I'm not sure what kind of quality food I'm going to get at that point. Very much so. Um, that uh, And the other thing I did love about the bar area were those little hooks. They did have the coat hooks or the purse hooks, um, bag hooks, backpack hooks, whatever bag you may bring. They have the hooks under the bar so you can get it out of your way and out of your neighbor's way, but still have it safe and next to you. So you're not trying to keep your, you know, Burberry purse, your $3,000 Burberry purse on the seat next to you so you can keep an eye on it you're not keeping it on the bar where beer is sloshing around or drinks are being spilled or food is all over the place or wet um, floor from the snow and that you know yeah. or, or the mag chloride from your shoes or if you're like in a place kind of like salt lake where you have like a ton of salt on the ground absolutely would destroy any of your bags even just a regular backpack yeah um so i, I really did appreciate that they did have some fun artwork in there um some interesting chandeliers it was fun and i like how you said if they had a happy hour yeah it didn't look like a very happy happy hour <laughs> it was pretty um quiet in there but i think probably part of what that is even with their happy hour menu um the prices are not happy hour prices no matter what. yeah i mean for like their appetizers i think they're still like on average about eight dollars a pop um in any case like for the type of restaurant we're going that we that this place is trying to push themselves off as being when you sit down at your booth you don't expect a uh, like a crumbled up napkin behind your head with another like set of silverware uh, nor do you expect a uh, clipboard on the floor right by your feet um <laughs> true story <laughs> yeah so like when we go when we went in there and we got uh, seated at our booth uh, Jesse's, I saw Jesse right away, just started <laughs> felling around with his feet. I'm like, dude, what's going on with this guy here? Like what's, what's going on with his feet? <laughs> and then he pulls out this like a uh, clipboard, um, that you shouldn't like have that happening at a restaurant that, you know, that, you know, for the prices that they're charging and stuff like that. And then right next to me in the booth, there, you had like this crumbled up, like dirty napkin <laughs> with like another like napkin with a bold silverware in it right next to my head. Uh, it, you know, it just doesn't really scream like the high end that they're trying to be and I, I guess i'm not really sure like you know i'm sure there's probably a more elegant way of trying to say that but really i think uh they like what they're trying to project and what they're actually doing are two different things and uh just from just that impression right there I would just really rather gone to the to the place right next door, which is the uh, tail to the tailgate <laughs> any day. <laughs> <laughs> now, as far as the food goes, right? As far as the food, um, I did order the uh, the buffalo burger, and the burger itself, the actual meat was actually really great, and the toppings with it was fresh, and that was really good. They had, uh, they sauteed the the onions really well. They used uh, smoked gouda on it. Excellent. That was that was like the main uh, that was the main thing that made me go with the uh, by uh, with the bison burger because I love smoked gouda. Where they failed mm. is on the bun. The bun was like super thick, and when you bought it, when you like when I bit into the burger, I got like a big like it just tastes like it tastes like I was eating bread, and really kind of like a soggy. Uh, greasy bread because uh, like I don't know I guess like the way they cooked the burger wasn't like I mean I asked for it medium so it was going to be a little bit greasy but it kind of like overly soaked in this big thick bun uh, the fries though here um, I did order I, I did an upcharge on my fries and I got the uh, green chili smothered fries the green chili tasted great um, the same, same with the fries. Uh, I think what they might have done though is they, uh, with the way they make their fries, I think they may have added too much salt, which kind of took away a little bit from the green chili smothered fries and it made it just a little bit more salty than what it should have been. And I think what may have caused that is, uh, I think with the green chili, because of the pork, you're going to get a little bit more saltiness anyways, right there. So I think with how they normally make the fries along with the green chili just made it a little bit 
closer to too much salt. Luckily, I like a lot of salt. So, I mean, I was able to eat it just fine, but I think the average person might find it a little bit too salty. Um, the waiter did it actually a good job for the most part, but he never like, he never mentioned anything. He never picked up like the clipboard by you or the napkins <laughs> by me. Um, but as far as delivering the food and checking in on us, I thought he did a decent job. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to say like the interior, I'm going to give that like a solid eight. Cause I did like the interior. I thought the interior was nice. Um, the service, I'm going to give that maybe like a, a seven. The uh, the food I'll give that like for the burger I'll give that like a I'm gonna give that like a six I've had better burgers elsewhere um, but the quality was I mean the quality was good it had fresh ingredients um, but because it's of the things like the napkins and the clipboards and the menu uh, the price value I don't think was really there. So overall, I'm going to give it a 6.5. It just kind of keeps going to drop and drop and drop. And drop. <laughs> like it has a whole lot of potential. But overall, because of those like those little outliner things, I really think it, like it would like the the interior, the atmosphere should be an eight. But because of like the clipboard, the nap, dirty napkin, uh, all those things, it drops it down pretty low. And then the food, you know, is solid but not great because of the soggy bun and or, and bread tasting. Uh, so yeah, I'm going to give it like. I don't know what I said before. I'm going to give it like 6.5. I'm going to say. That's I'm gonna, exactly what you said. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm saying solid 6.5 then. Um, I think there's a whole lot of potential. And maybe uh, maybe my, my rating could have been higher if I would have ordered something different. And because like, you know, some of the pasta that they had there and the steaks might have been actually really excellent. And uh, it might have been actually really great with some of the wines that they have there because they do have an excellent wine menu. Um, so based off of a burger, uh, 6.5 and I would have rather gone to the tailgate uh, Maybe one of the other dishes and you got something different than I did so you might view this slightly bit different than me uh, But I think the potential is there to be much higher. So I do recommend going to the place uh, going to uh, Parker garage Yeah, uh, for me um, Some of the experience was the same some of it a little bit different. So for me the atmosphere was interesting and It wasn't anything bad. It wasn't anything um, great. Uh, it was good. Uh, so for me, the atmosphere is a seven. I didn't like the high tables that, yeah, and you pointed them out where you have quite possibly seven different groups of two sitting next to each other, not knowing the people next to them. Cause sometimes you just want a quiet conversation, but because of that, they also have booths, they have tables. Uh, they do have a menagerie of seating options. So I had the smoked brisket sandwich, uh, which is they take the smoked brisket and then they braise that brisket. Um, they throw on a little bit of their honey barbecue sauce, um, white cheddar and onions um, on a hoagie roll that had a, a little bit of a crunchy side that tasted a little bit like that's where the white cheddar probably was, was on the top of that hoagie roll. And for me, that sandwich was amazing. And it wasn't outrageously priced, $18. I had the brisket, the braised brisket was delicious. The onions really made that sandwich pop. Would I go back there for that sandwich? Absolutely. Would I go back there for a burger? Probably not. I mean, right next door is less than half the price. Uh, one interesting thing though, is you mentioned your fries. I also got fries with my sandwich and my fries were amazing. And when I say amazing, these are the kind of fries that are so good. They offer you ketchup and you say, no, I, I did not want any ketchup. The fries were perfectly salted, not overly crispy, just crispy enough on the outside, still tender on the inside. Great flavor. They were perfect. French fries, if there can be such a thing, uh, just amazing French fries. Um, overall, the only piece of the service I didn't really care for was at the end when all of our glasses were empty. And I'm like, well, I probably would have gotten some more water or another glass of wine, but the guy hasn't come around. Um, that was the one part of the service that I didn't think was outstanding. But other than that, the guy was doing a nice job. Um, again, 
atmosphere a seven service for me was a seven food for me um, that's where my sandwich again was great was an eight um, i did not have some of those other things on the menu um, when you start to wrap this whole picture up this is where it gets tricky because it does have so much potential and i think they're trying to meet somewhere in between all right we got the tailgate and possibly bikers next door but we want to serve high-end food so we're going to call it the garage the parker garage and and we're going to be somewhere halfway in between with the environment and the extra details. Well, for me, the devil is in the details. And the, the details were absolutely in my sandwich. All of it was perfect. Um, it was really great. I, honestly, that I should probably give my sandwich a nine. Um, it really was that good. But when I tie together all of the little details, um, that's what brings my overall experience right down to that about seven um, point. And then also just with potential value, that's where the details take away or add to the value. I started with a, a glass of Robert Hall cab. I don't know Robert Hall cab. It was not great. It was okay. It was decent, but it was the cab on the happy hour. Um, their happy hour wines were $8 a glass. I did not see that cab on the regular one list. Um, so I'm wondering if it's just for the happy hour and it's a lower quality than some of their nicer wines. And they did have a nice wine list. Noah was not wrong there. Um, a couple things. Would I meet a friend there? Absolutely. But before I met a friend there, 99 out of 100 times, I would go next door to tailgate. Would I take a date there? Yes. Um, but unless I'm trying to impress her, 99 out of 100 times, I'm taking a date next door to the tailgate. <laughs> uh, more fun, more energy, great food. Um, so unless I want that quiet, uh, romantic, more romantic uh, atmosphere, I'm going to the tailgate. Um, the Parker Garage was a little bit more reserved. But again, once you start to take away the details of the nicer menus or the napkins and clipboards and little things they've left behind, the dust on the chandeliers, that's where you lose it. But um, very much so the, the wait staff, the chefs, um, you could tell they are definitely trying to take this food to that next level. Uh, mine was there. It was great. Um, Overall, I am going to give it a seven. I did really enjoy it. Um, and someday I might go back just for that sandwich. But again, most likely 99 out of 100 times and going next door. Movie review of Violent Night. Yes. Cookie Bear! <laughs> So the smarter <laughs> challenge was Cookie <Okay>, Bear. <laughs> and during the previews. I mean, we have to start off with Cookie okay, Bear. I mean, I think he got that, here. <laughs> during the previews before the show, one of the previews starts and all you see is ah and I and I did I had no idea right at the beginning. I'm like, what what is this? You see these two paramedics walking up to a house and there's like the door is half a jar and there's a little bit of blood and then they open the, the door to the cabin and there's a lot of blood and I mean like a lot of blood <laughs> um, and they're just looking around like what happened here and then one of the paramedics <laughs> opens a door into a room inside the cabin and you see just the, the I'm going to say the snout the face of a bear come out of a shadow and just start to growl fully covered in blood at which point I immediately yelled <laughs> Cocaine bear, <laughs> and everyone in the audience is like, "What the hell is wrong with Except this?" Except for guy? Jesse and I, who are just laughing their asses <laughs> off because we have been eagerly anticipating this movie since I thought it was a joke when Noah first mentioned it about a month earlier. <laughs> <laughs> and the funny part, though, I think here too, like as we, I mean, if you haven't seen the preview, you have to watch the preview because it's hilarious. But uh, at the end of the preview, there's this couple who's sitting like right next to us. And uh, the, the lady goes, can we see this? And out of nowhere, I just yell, yes. <laughs> Without thinking. I didn't know. She wasn't talking to me. She, was talking she, to me. <laughs> she wasn't talking to Noah. He was talking to her anyway. <laughs> <laughs> she looks over at her date. Can we see this? And Noah's like, yes. 
I was laughing so hard through two thirds of this commercial because it is so unbelievably funny, but it's not like <laughs> uh, if you're not ready for it, it's not going to be funny. So don't go thinking it's like comical. It's not a comedy movie at all. It's uh, I, don't know, I think it was comical. Well, it, it is to us. It's loosely <laughs> based on a true story where uh, loosely is like the key word. Here. <laughs> loose, very loosely, like loose stooly, uh, based on a true story where a bunch of cocaine was thrown over out the window of a plane because they didn't want to get caught with it, and a bear got into it. <laughs> Real life story, the real cocaine bear died five minutes after eating 70 pounds. Actually, it's like more like 88 pounds because it was like 40 kilos <laughs> of uh, cocaine. And uh, But uh, this movie looks hilarious. But anyways, you have to understand, like when we went to go see Violent Night uh, before we do our movie review on it, we had just finished shooting Scotch Hour. So we, got, we shot Scotch Hour last week, and we zoomed right over to go see Violent Night. So we already had a little bit of scotch in us, and uh, then that preview came out. So it was just kind of like a huge uh, laugh, I guess, uh, laughing fest there. It was hilarious. It was literally hilarious, which All right. led right into the smarter challenge, Violent Night. <laughs> So this movie, uh, December 22 release, starring David Harbour and John Lugazamo, uh, for me, man, okay, first of all, it is not for the faint of heart. It is definitely violent. The violent word in the title is 100% appropriate. It is a very violent movie, but it was also a home run in my book. I think it was, yes, it was a violent movie. I thought it was hilarious. I was laughing quite a bit throughout the movie. Um, it, 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 like, And honestly, it's still like, it still conveys the Christmas message and belief in Santa or, or believing in Santa or believing, you know, in the Christmas spirit and, or Christmas magic, if you will. But it is just hilarious uh, and violent. It really is. It's like, to me, I think when I, because I think I, I saw it before you did anyways. And I think I kind of described it to you as being like home alone uh, meets like saw. <laughs> <laughs> yeah blood wise that's probably pretty close <laughs> not far off well let's do this okay. let's bounce back and forth some of our favorite scenes do you have um one of your what was one of your favorite scenes okay. from this movie so one of my favorite <laughs> scenes uh, i guess i'm gonna go chronologically here okay okay so one of my favorite scenes in this movie happens to be He's like it starts off him sitting in the in the pub and you see it. Yes, uh, you see it on the on the TV commercial. He's on, he's in the pub and he's drinking, <sighs> and the bar, and the bartender's like, uh, "Would you like another drink?" And he's like, "I'm still vertical, am I? Aren't I?" And he's like, "Yeah, of course I want another drink." <laughs> and then the other guy and he's like talking and contemplating like how this is gonna be the last Christmas, whatever. And there's this other guy who's like a, he's like a mall Santa or whatever. <laughs> he's like, "Here, I'll buy that guy's drink or whatever," and so. Santa Claus goes up to the roof and takes off. And uh, <laughs> I, I, I'm skipping a part here because I, I think they might have mentioned it on the uh, commercial or not. But he, she is like, are you driving? He's like, I, 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 I kind of steer a little bit, but the reindeer do most <laughs> of the driving. The and, uh, and then, uh, you know, everyone's like laughing at him like, oh, ha, ha, what a great joke or whatever. But anyways, as he's like flying away off the roof with the reindeer, he this is my favorite part right here. He oh like my God. he like leans over the sleigh as the bartender comes out on top of the roof to say like, "Hey, you can't be on the roof." And he pukes all over her as she's like, "Oh, Santa Claus is real." And, and all these like <laughs> chunks, and you see like the Aww. chunks from the vomit and whatever <laughs> land on her face and stuff. It's hilarious. Cookies and milk and beer. yeah. <laughs> so that that probably be my very that's like the, one of the very first scenes I thought was pretty good. It is a great scene. Um, man, it, it's, it's hard to go in chronicle chronological order here because there were so many great scenes. And it I is. I think after that, I'm not really sure how they all uh, fall like, in place. It, it's just a great start to the movie. It is a fantastic start to a movie. I, mean, I think for me, one of the pieces that makes that to your point is she's like, you want another beer? And he's like, yeah, I'm still vertical. Aren't I? Yeah, let's have another beer. And then the mall Santa is like, I've got his tab. And after he's like talking about, it's probably going to be his last year. And then he's going to get out of there. And as you mentioned, I did love it. She's, 
she's like, you're not driving, are you? And he's like, no, nah, I mean, I, I steer a little bit, but the reindeer do most of the work. And then he goes up the stairs as he's leaving. And the, the mall Santa and the bartender are laughing so hard that all of a sudden he, the mall Santa is like, hey, does he know that that's the roof? And she goes to chase him. Um, and she's like looking all around and he's not there. And she's like starting to worry that maybe he jumped off the edge. She sees him flying this great big smile. Boom. Hits with <laughs> vomit. I loved it too. Definitely a, a great start to this movie. Um, I, I, I want to jump to one of my favorite scenes um, that I have thought about multiple times, mostly because of the holiday season and because Home Alone is a great Christmas movie, definitely in my top 10. And there is one point where there is a little girl in the movie and she is the person who has made her Christmas wish and that Santa's trying to fill because she's on the nice list. Not very many people are, by the way. She, though, is on the nice list. So he is trying to save her. Well, she has to go and hide because Santa's a little busy at the time. <laughs> and she like immediately thinks, okay, I got it. Like, she had watched Home Alone. So she immediately is going to set some booby traps. Well, she sets her booby traps. And then two of the, ultimately, there's a group of assassins in a house to get up to steal $3 million. Um, Three hundred million dollars. Three hundred million. Three hundred million dollars. And with that, um, she uh, sets a booby trap. Now, one of the things she does is she puts a nail in the stairs at eye level. That is a big ass nail. This is a six inch nail. It's, it goes an inch through the step, and it's like another four to five inches long. So maybe a five inch nail. Um, as these assassins come around, um, they they see the nail one of them and looks up the stairs and he's like okay she's up there and um he yells up it's not a booby trap if i can see it well what we know that he doesn't know because he's so focused on the nail at eye level is that as soon as he takes two steps up the steps have been cut right down the middle and they will fail and he takes the two steps up and he falls right <laughs> on that nail and it goes right through his under jaw and you see it come through his mouth and he's screaming and holding his mouth open because it's trying to pull poke into the top of his mouth, super painful. And the other assassin, uh, by the way, they all have great nicknames, whose nickname is Candy Cane, right? Yeah, I think, I think that's, that's Candy Cane. And she literally is like stepping on his head and stepping around him to go up and get the girl. But the funniest part is just this whole piece of, that's literally how booby traps work. You see it time and time again. Another prime example is in Predator, when Arnold Schwarzenegger sets his booby trap and he crawls into the little um, the, the little um, low land and there's a tree with a bunch of spikes um, and the predator goes the other way around. Well, yeah, booby trap's not a booby trap if you can see it unless it's part of the booby trap. Um, and it was just hilarious to have this whole thing go on because he is stuck on this nail because the steps are broken below <laughs> him and he can't get down and he can't lift himself up for minutes until the whole thing is resolved and once he finally gets off the nail, another booby trap kills him. <laughs> It's not really the booby trap. It's part of the booby trap that failed that somebody else killed him with. <laughs> what, what I don't get is how, like, in that scene right there, where did, how did the other bowling balls totally miss him? It had to be just the one with that one lady, like, where Kenny King rolls a ball out and hits him at the very end and kills him. I would have suspected other bowling balls would have landed on him. Well, some of the bowling balls did hit him. But the thing is, is the nail was still through his jaw. And when he finally got off of the nail and then he pulls the nail out and he's looking at it, that's when the candy cane throws that other bowling ball out of her way and it goes down and it hits the nail he's looking at and he goes straight into his head and kills him. So there's some other like kind of like uh, little Easter eggs in here. And one of the like... It's I, 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 this kind of falls into my favorite categories, but it wasn't like a super big part, but it did make me laugh or chuckle a little bit is when he's like reaching into his bag to try to pull out a bat <laughs> or something. And he pulls out a movie and he's like, uh, die hard Blu-ray. I don't need that. And he tosses it off to the side. <laughs> 
I mean, if you think Die Hard's a Christmas movie and you saw that, I thought it was pretty humorous there. Um, I thought that was great in particular because shortly after that in the movie, they go in and they are uh, after a senator. Um, and the senator's got her kill squad. She actually is the one who stole 300 million, by the way, and has been hiding it. That they are now trying to steal. So she herself is not on the nice list. No, um, definitely not. Definitely not. But she's got her kill squad, and uh, the kill squad is coming to save the day, so to speak. And then you find out the kill squad that arrives, just like in Die Hard, all wearing white on snowmobiles, is actually the other part of the bad guy. Is that from Die Hard 2, really? Uh, it is from Die Hard 2. It's not from Nakatomi Plaza. It is from the airport. And yes, it's <laughs> when all the mercenaries um, show up on their snowmobiles. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, it was great. Oh, man. Um, that is a great one. Another one of my favorite parts is when they're rolling up, there is... Uh, a couple in the movie, a sister and a brother that are the children of the senator. And the daughter is married to a famous actor um, who's uh, a fighter, Cam Gigadon. Gigadet. Um, and with this, he's in the movie Never Back Down, if you've seen that. So he's got at least some training for a movie. And in this movie, he's supposed to be some badass fighter who also does movies. And he's famous. He's famous in Asia. Right. He's famous in Asia. But only parts of Asia. <laughs> only parts of Asia. And uh, the guy's a total dipshit. Like, it, it's hilarious. Um, and the wife keeps believing that he's going to save the day. He's going to fight all these bad bad guys and save the day and the first chance he gets he kicks one of the bad guys jumps out the window and runs away and then thinks he's safe because the kill squad's coming up and they're all white on their snowmobiles and they just blow him away uh but then the the part that the the real clincher here is when the mom's talking to the daughter later and she's <laughs> like jean-claude van dipshit here <laughs> ran away <laughs> <laughs> all right so i think this pulls up one of my favorite characters of the movie uh he's not in a movie like a ton he, he has like a very short spot in it but he's a demented freak and that's Cram the guy who plays krampus and krampus is played by brendan fletcher and he's the guy who's like he's like uh the way he his voice is the way he kind of dances around he's you can tell he's like some kind of psychomaniac and like there's a part where he's like or john lou gamos uh uh who plays scrooge right i think that's his name yeah uh it says uh uh he pull, he like pulls out like a nutcracker and, talk, and so he talks about breaking a <laughs> person's finger and then he's like this scene, <laughs> five minutes non-stop laughing <laughs> so but then finally John Lugazamo Luke, pulls out like a big huge nutcracker he's like these are should be made for breaking nuts and he talks and he's like Candy Cane grab, grab his nut and put it in here and smash yes. it and Candy Cane's like no I'm not gonna like touch his junk he's like well, you scooped out people's brains before she's like yeah I'll scoop out a brain but I'm not gonna touch, touch his junk and then Krampus like he's like all kind of like, dancing and oh, I'll do it <laughs> I'll do it <laughs> <laughs> she's like what kind of I just I remember I I said a few things during the movie that were not totally appropriate because I'm like what is wrong with this sick guy this guy was a total like he, there's something totally wrong with him and then later on like when he's like trying to convince the family to like open up presents and stuff like that honestly I thought his character kind of like definitely stole like that scene and stuff like that and it kind of goes along with like your Jean-Claude Von Dipshit because Jean-Claude Von Dipshit is the one who kick, kicks him, kicks Krampus to escape. So it kind of works out all kind of like ties it together right there. Oh. It's uh, that, 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 that scene or that uh, kind of like uh, multiple scenes pieced together is hilarious. Now, one notable scene, um, also a favorite scene, not super hilarious, but notable because it is definitely impactful, is when Krampus is going around. He's like, let's have some fun. Let's give you guys your presents. You might all be dead tomorrow. <laughs> 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 and he's giving out, handing out gifts, or he's going to, and then the family starts doing it, and they're all being jerks to each other. Um, so they're trying to hand gifts, and you see 
some terrible gifts and then you get to one gift that has a note in it and it's from the son to the mother the senator um and she opens up this box and it is a bottle of omen 14 14, yes um i thought that was great because i think that is legitimate when you know someone well enough and she literally says my favorite scotch when you know someone well enough that you know if not one of their favorite scotches but literally their favorite scotch man you know that person uh it could yeah. be their favorite bourbon their favorite whiskey their favorite vodka their favorite gin um we've all got favorites but when you know someone's favorite scotch in particular and it's it's a steadfast one like the Owen 14 this has got some history some lineage and it's a great damn scotch um that was very impactful to me because that's that's family right there and even though this is a twisted family and different things <laughs> Come from this and we don't get to find out right away what's on that note because the mom reads the note the senator and she's super happy and she just looks at him and she's like thank you and they're all like read the note and she's like maybe later and she just <laughs> puts it on her inside pocket closes up her jacket and when you find out what's on that note to me i'm like that's a damn good mom right there. <laughs> but it also tells you like how twisted their family is too right do you want me to go ahead and mention the note or save that for later? Oh, no, you can. Uh, All right. So what we'll go to is fast forward nearly to the end of the movie. You find out what's on the note. And what's on the note is that the son in that note did not want the mom to be reading that <laughs> note while he was there. He let her know he stole the $300 million And his plans were to run away, um, try to recover and save his marriage because um, he wanted a family and his, his wife and he were having problems and they had a beautiful smart daughter that he really wanted to bring back the a family setting for not just for himself i i really feel like he was trying to get the whole package for himself for his wife and for his daughter um but the way the mom responds and she's like i've never been more proud of you <laughs> it wasn't her money anyway no it wasn't uh, um so like it's the taxpayer's I money i don't think she would care i wouldn't care like if your kid is so desperate they're going to steal ten dollars from your wallet to go buy condoms thank you <laughs> i'd have given it to you <laughs> right right 300 million might be a little bit different but still <laughs> so looking at this movie here right the director is uh tommy uh Workola, yes and he directed some of my favorite like kind of oddball like horror movies which is dead snow and dead snow 2 where like these zombie nazi people come to life so it just it it kind of like you kind of see his like directing style if you saw those earlier films of his uh kind of like they kind of appear here in this movie yeah especially with some of the death scenes and um one of my favorite death scenes is when this guy throws a grenade at chris, at, at chris kringle and he picks up the grenade puts it back inside the guy's like suit and he goes stocking stuffer and then walks <laughs> away and he goes wait maybe i should watch this and he turns around and sees the guy totally explode yeah <laughs> yeah i don't remember his exact words but i loved that too there's another death scene that i really liked a lot but i'll i think you're gonna mention it uh having to do with the skate oh man um am i right were you is that one of your scenes that you're going to talk about you know i do love that scene but you go for it you mention it okay so <laughs> so as we find out later on that santa claus here is like this old uh viking uh and he has his uh skull crusher was a hammer of his anyways he uh he kind of like finds a sledgehammer and kind of like brings back his old former self as he's trying to save this family and try to save the good girl from the nice list he finds these pair of skates and starts using them as blades and stuff and cutting up these uh soldiers and stuff and then there's a part where he takes a, this blade and it, like slams into the guy's neck and basically decapitates him and you see the body just slouch down with blood squirting out all over the place so i thought that was great that's like one of those scenes that reminded me of dead snow uh kind of like where like one of the scenes in there that remembers where this guy like uh, disembowels a Nazi member and grabs the uh, intestines and jumps off a cliff. Pretty hilarious stuff. And that's what this, uh, this that scene kind of reminded me of. That's interesting. Now, you mentioned the director, um, Tommy Workola, and I am not familiar with the Dead Snow movies, but what I am familiar with that I 
greatly enjoyed. I actually thought it was the best version I've ever seen of this was his version of Hansel and Gretel. Okay. And what I loved about this is it's that dark side where you've got Hawkeye playing Hansel. Oh, that one. Okay. Yes. And um, it, it's, it's this darker version much like the books really were. And Santa Claus, if you look at the German versions, was not so, like, yeah, if you were bad, you didn't just get coal. You got coal shoved in places. <laughs> like, it was, Krumpus was a, a bad guy. Like, yeah, it, it was legit. <laughs> um, you get Santa Claus or you get Krumpus? Yeah, so with that, I really, and, and we got Santa Claus, by the way. We're on the nice list. <laughs> Good to be a conservative. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta keep being good. I gotta keep being good. It's so good to be good. <laughs> oh man! Um, but with that, um, I, I, some of the things about his characters in all of his movies, um, John Lugazamo did an amazing job. Scrooge as the main bad guy, and he is just point blank what you would expect. He is literally looking at this, and he's like, "What is wrong with you people?" <laughs> like he's like, "I'm here for three hundred million dollars," and the, the 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 mom, the senator, keeps telling him, "You don't know half of you don't know anything," and he keeps telling her and besting her at every point. He's like, "I knew everything. I was ready. I know about your kill squad. They're going to be here in an hour and fifteen minutes." He knows it right down to the point when they show up at the front gate and it's not her kill squad it's his kill squad um but the character i liked even more than his really was candy cane and her influence <laughs> in the movie because i do think that that's something that tommy Ricola does is he brings in these characters and whether it's hansel and Gretchen you're dealing with vampires and witches or violent night um candy cane this female mercenary is sitting there and she's like Maybe he really is Santa Claus <laughs> and John Lu <laughs> Lucas Amos or G Scrooge's character's like, oh, <laughs> he's losing his mind. He's like, she's crazy. Don't listen to her. Let's go. Let's move on. <laughs> Meanwhile, she's right. It's like, because they're like trying to, they, they get Santa Claus's bag and the one the the main mercenary who ultimately takes the nail to the chin and then to the forehead is reaching into the bag to see what he, he's like what have you got in this bag have you got money have you got weapons and he goes brings out a present brings out a hockey stick and like the bag's like this deep and he's bringing out things twice the size of the bag and this is where candy cane's like maybe he really is santa claus and they're like shut up um and uh yeah she her little pieces throughout the movie where she's like hey yo maybe he really is santa claus not just once twice but at least thrice that i can remember were brilliantly placed um and it's literally one of those things where you have a mercenary and, and a leader of these mercenaries, John Luzamo, Scrooge, and he literally knows, truth, truly knows every step the senator and her bodyguards and her kill squad are going to make. Um, the one thing, and, and this is typical, we all have one blind side, and sometimes that blind side is a piece of faith. And that was absolutely his blind side is having any possibility that there really was a santa claus that 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 piece of faith and you find out later in the movie why um as a kid that, that he had that blind side and didn't believe in santa claus um it, it, it's interesting um but i thought it was absolutely beautiful the way it was written and then directed so even though we've talked about like a lot of the violent scenes and stuff like this it does still bring in like the whole kind of christmas spirit or the magic of christmas because at the end, like Santa Claus ends up dying, and what brings him back is the belief of Santa, and so then they're able to revive him after he has been dead for a little bit. Um, any last things you want to say about uh, Violent Night as we wrap this uh, Smarter Challenge up? I uh, definitely in my top three favorite Christmas movies now. And it's tough because there are some great ones out there. I do truly love Die Hard. I've only seen Violent Night, the ones, wanted to go see it a, a second time, but got wrapped up in work stuff and couldn't go see it or didn't go see it. And I will look forward to watching it time and time again, but it is also not a movie for the faint of heart. Um, it makes Die Hard look 
docile with its <laughs> violence. It's it's amazing that a, a, a movie can do that. Um, but I absolutely loved it. I thought that John Lugizamo was perfect as the Scrooge. anti-hero. Yep. Um, David Harbour, my favorite role. And he has done amazing things in Stranger Things. Uh, but he was amazing in here. And just good, mostly clean fun. <laughs> I, I guess if I were some of this, this would be Home Alone for Adults. That's a pretty good way to put it. <laughs> and it is one of my favorite. I'd say it's in my top five of Christmas movies now. Uh, and I've already seen it twice. <laughs> I, and I wouldn't mind seeing it a third time. It is, it's a fun ride. It's pretty, like, but you have to be okay with the violence. So um, other, otherwise, um, I don't know. Um, but I would definitely highly recommend seeing it. It'll probably, it may only be in the theaters by the time you guys see this, maybe for a few more days. Uh, but if you do have a chance to go see it in the theaters, I definitely would. Um, and when it finally comes out, definitely check it out. Um, I guess with that, what's our next, uh, next week's scotch? All right. Next week's scotch. Noah has selected for us the Oban Special Release 2022 10-year Single malt scotch. Diageo has come out with a limited release of this and a few others. And this Oban is sure to be a treat. I hope so, since Oban is one of my favorite scotch houses. And in the movie, <laughs> it definitely is in the movie. Uh, my favorite isn't the 14, though, but that's all right. Um, any case, uh, I do look forward to this one. I've only seen two bottles out. So if you can find it, I'm imagining it'd be pretty good. So you might want to pick it up. Uh, I've been is. looking. I haven't found it. <laughs> <laughs> I have been looking. Like I want this bottle. I, I mean, it, like the description seems like it'd be a very tasty bottle. Uh, in any case, um, the subject for next week, since we're going to be on our New Year week here when this kind of releases, you know, the whole New Year, New You type of thing. <laughs> uh, I, I kind of mentioned this to Jesse before. Yeah, I wasn't really sure what my topic was going to be, but I figured what we'll do is we'll do a review of the Netflix series You, uh, and we'll talk about uh, about that because this guy, uh, if you've never seen the, the the series, it is about this gentleman who uh, is trying to find love, and he's also trying to improve himself. So New Year, New You, we'll tie that in this TV series in with uh, I guess New Year resolutions with that. I guess New Year, New You type of thing. Kind of keep on that theme there. All right, uh, with that, thank you everyone who watches us on YouTube and Rumble. Thank you to everyone who uh, listens to us on our many platforms. And uh, thank you again. This has uh, been one of our better months again uh, for those who listen and watch us. So we greatly appreciate that. Uh, hopefully you, uh, you and your family have a wonderful Christmas and or whatever holiday you do celebrate if you don't celebrate Christmas. And with that, I'll pass it along to you, Jesse. All right. Well, um, definitely want to keep this positive, but also be real at the same time. First thing is life is great. And it really is great. Life is great. Now, that doesn't always mean life is easy. Um, there are absolutely trying times for everyone, and the holidays tend to bring out some of those more trying times. And um, one of the things I am grateful for is we're, uh, you know, this is ultimately our Christmas edition, is uh, Noah. Um, and uh, thank you for being a phenomenal friend, someone who listened to me vent about work earlier for like half an hour um, because I literally could not believe and needed someone to talk to uh, because it was driving me anxious. And I am not an anxious person. So when I get anxious, there is definitely something wrong. So I am grateful for friends. So uh, again, life is great. Um, not always easy. Take some time with friends and family, even if you feel like you don't want to, even if things are so bad, you think you need to stay away from everyone, go find some time, go see a good movie or watch a movie at home, or even just read your favorite book or magazine, read an article, read something that is true to your heart, give yourself a little bit of a release, a getaway, um, and, and hopefully you do have a friends and, and or family that you can talk to because that is very important this time of year life is stressful uh, but life life 
is great. So uh, thank you to all of our viewers. Let us know what you think. Give us some feedback. We do appreciate any feedback. Do you like us flipping a coin? Um, for me, it's pretty exciting. I can tell you, I am glad it landed the way it did. I wish I was that lucky ever in Vegas. I <laughs> would be rich. Um, not that lucky when I play roulette. But uh, life has been great. Um, and that and that's really the key is the tough times bring reward. You, you, you finish that and you have some great times. So I'm going to let that go. I hope everyone has a very Merry Christmas, a wonderful holiday, a few minutes with your favorite pet, your favorite friends, your family, um, anything, anyone, your getaway, your house, your trees, your shrubs. Maybe it is your plants that are your friends, whatever that is. Take some time just for you. Have a great holiday. Uh, and with that, please like, share, and subscribe. And like, share, subscribe. Na 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 Scotchman. Cheers. Cheers. We hope you enjoyed this evening's episode of Scotch Hour. If you did, please like, share, and subscribe. Also, if you have not done so already, please become a patron member with memberships starting as low as one dollar a month. Thank you, and hopefully, you have a wonderful evening.